So this is chapter 15 in which we're going to talk about sensory pathways and the somatic nervous system. So we'll start with a quick review and an overview and we're going to cover a little bit of information that you should have learned at the end of the A&P 1 semester. So at the end of A&P 1 we went over the different divisions of the nervous system. So as a quick review, first we can divide the nervous system into the central nervous system, which is the brain and spinal cord, and the peripheral nervous system, which is all the rest of the nerves in your body outside of the brain and spinal cord. We can then divide the peripheral nervous system into an afferent branch, which is ascending. So these are neurons that are running from the body and taking information up to the brain. And then we have the efferent or descending division, which is taking commands from the brain and passing them down to the body. We can further divide the efferent division into the somatic and autonomic divisions. So again, remember efferent is the commands that the brain is sending out to the body. So the somatic division is carrying commands to skeletal muscles, and the autonomic division is carrying commands to smooth muscle, cardiac muscle, and glands, including adipose tissue. We can then further subdivide the autonomic nervous division into the sympathetic and parasympathetic divisions. The sympathetic division is the fight or flight, which prepares your body to handle emergencies. And the parasympathetic division is your rest and digest, which is your normal everyday function. So in chapters 13 and 14, last semester, you covered the CNS. You looked at the brain and the spinal cord. In chapter 16 of last semester, you looked at the autonomic division of the efferent peripheral nervous system, which covered the sympathetic and parasympathetic divisions. So that brings us to this chapter, chapter 15. In this chapter, we're going to be looking at the afferent division, which is sensory information going from the body up to the brain. And then we're going to look at the somatic division of the efferent system, which is carrying commands from the brain down to the skeletal muscles. So again, if we look at the divisions of the peripheral nervous system, we have the afferent division, which is the ascending information going from the body up to the brain. We're going to talk about this in more detail in this chapter and in chapter 17. And this is going to include your sensory receptors, your sensory neurons, and the various sensory pathways. So somatic sensory info, which is information, these are considered your body senses. This is like your touch, uh, your smell, your taste, uh, the position of your joints and muscles um, in relation to the trunk of your body. All of this type of information is going to go to specific sensory cortical areas that we'll talk about in more detail as we go through this chapter in chapter 17. Your visceral sensory info was covered more last semester with the autonomic nervous system, and that information goes up to reflex centers in the brainstem, although we'll also mention that briefly again in this chapter. Then the other division of the peripheral nervous system is the efferent division, which is the descending information going from the brain down to the body. And this is divided into the somatic and autonomic divisions. The autonomic divisions we talked about last semester in chapter 16, that was the sympathetic versus parasympathetic division. And then in chapter 15, we're going to talk about the somatic division, which carries information to skeletal muscles and we call this the somatic nervous system. So this is the part of your commands coming from your brain that you have voluntary control over. So for example, if you wanna raise your hand or you wanna get up and walk to the kitchen. So these are voluntary commands going down to your skeletal muscles. And so in this chapter, we're gonna look at these motor nuclei, motor tracts, and motor neurons. And just as a reminder again from last semester, when you see the word nuclei in relation to the nervous system, we're talking about a collection of neuronal cell bodies in the brain or spinal cord. And when we see the term tract, we're talking about a collection of neuronal axons, um, again, that are in the brain or spinal cord. So remember that terminology from last semester.
So again, here is an overview of what we're going to be looking at uh, both in this chapter and chapter 17. So everything starts with an arriving stimulus, so some type of a stimulus. Um, it could be external or internal, and this is going to cause the depolarization of a sensory receptor, and that's going to cause the resting membrane potential of that receptor to change. Remember, we call those graded potentials, and if the graded potential re reaches threshold, then we get the generation of an action potential, which is going to travel along an axon, so that's what the uh, term that we use called propagation. If you need to review these different steps, then go back and look at chapter 12 that you covered last semester. That's where you talked about these different steps and the uh, sending of information along neurons. So eventually the stimulus is going to make its way from the periphery to the central nervous system using these um, pathways, these electrical signals. When it gets to the central nervous system, it's going to be processed, um, and this happens in the brain and spinal cord. And then if it's going to trigger an automatic response, so an involuntary response, then you're going to send a command through the motor pathway um, as part of your autonomic nervous system. And again, we covered that in Chapter 16. And then in this chapter, we're going to focus more on this motor pathway that's voluntary. So this involves actual perception of the sensory input. So you think about what you felt, what the sensory stimulus was, and you make a decision about how to act. And so you're going to send out commands to your voluntary skeletal muscles. So for example, if you see a bug on your, or you feel a bug or see a bug crawling on your hand and you want to slap it away, right, that would be a voluntary response. And so that would go um, from your hand up to your brain. You make a decision, ooh, a bug, and you want to slap it away, and that would go down here through the uh, voluntary motor pathway. So this is what we're going to be talking about in chapters uh, 15 and 17. In this section, we're going to look at an introduction to sensory systems and talk about some terminology and the difference between our general senses and our special senses. So first, some terminology. So when we talk about sensory receptors, we are talking about specialized cells that can monitor conditions both inside the body or in the external environment. These receptors can actually be neurons themselves or they can be specialized cells that are monitored by sensory neurons. In other words, the dendrite or cell body of a sensory neuron is attached to these receptors. Another term to be familiar with is sensation. So a sensation is technically the information arriving into your uh, spinal cord and brain from the sensory receptors. So this is like the actual physical action potentials that are arriving. You haven't done any interpretation yet, so you haven't thought about what you're feeling or seeing or hearing. This is just like the raw data coming into the central nervous system. To contrast that, perception is the conscious awareness of a situation. So you're like, oh, those are some pretty colors, or oh, that's a beautiful music, or you know, oh, that feels rough, right? So those are perceptions. Those are your higher level brain functions that are actually thinking about the sensations and what they mean to you. And people can have different perceptions uh, even given the same sensation, depending on exactly how their brain develops. And a good example of this is there is a small percentage of the population that has a condition called synesthesia, where some of their sensory information, the um, way that the sensory information goes from the body up to the brain is different than the rest of us. So for example, the part of their brain that sees letters on a page may also be connected to the part of their brain that perceives different colors. So they may always see, for example, an S as being a red color, even if it's not, an S is red to them. So they have like multiple sensory perceptions attached to sensations that the rest of us doesn't, don't have. So sometimes you can describe people with synesthesia as hearing colors or seeing sounds are actually being able to taste a physical touch. So they kind of have like their wires crossed, for lack of a better term. 
where their sensory information is going to their sensations are going to multiple areas in their central nervous system, which is causing them to have a different perception than the rest of us. So let's talk about the difference between your general senses and your special senses. This chapter, we're gonna focus on the general senses and then chapter 17 is devoted to the special senses. So you may have always heard that you have five senses. Well, you actually have a lot more than five senses. So if we look at the types of sensory information, our general senses are those of temperature, pain, touch, pressure, vibration, and proprioception. And proprioception is like your body sense, so your awareness of the position of your body in space. Like you know if you're holding your arm above your head, right? That's because of proprioception. Your special senses are the ones that you learned about when you were actually in school. These are those five senses that you learned about, but you have many more, as I just mentioned. So your special senses are olfaction, which is smell, vision, which is your sight, gustation, which is taste, equilibrium, and then hearing. So the location of your general senses are scattered throughout the body. So you have receptors for temperature, pain, touch, pressure, vibration, and proprioception throughout your entire body. So they're not localized to any one area. Your special senses are localized to special sensory organs. For example, the only place in your body where you have vision is your eyes. The only place where you have hearing is your ears. The only place where you have gustation is your tongue. Right, so these are special sensory organs, so they are all the receptors are highly lo localized to one area. The sensory receptor structure for the general senses is fairly simple, and for the special senses, the receptor structures are fairly complex, and that's why we have an entire chapter devoted to the special senses, so we can go over those complex receptor structures. And then finally, if we look at the destination in the central nervous system, all of your general sense information is gonna to go to your primary sensory cortex in the parietal lobe of your brain. This is also called the primary somatosensory cortex. And if you remember from last semester, this is located on the post-central gyrus in your parietal lobe. Your special senses are gonna to go to specific cortical areas. So for example, your vision information is gonna to go to your visual cortex, which is located in your occipital lobe. The hearing information is gonna to go to the auditory cortex located in your temporal lobe, et cetera. And we're gonna talk about all of those specific areas in chapter 17. And then let's go over the general steps of sensory information processing before we get into the details about how this happens. So remember that the sensory information uh, processing happens in four stages. First, you have a sensory receptor that gets stimulated by a stimulus. And we're gonna talk about the structure of receptors later and in chapter 17. But that's the first step is the receptor has to be stimulated. The next step is that the receptor has to take that stimulus and it has to convert it into an electrical signal because that's the only language our nervous system understands. And we call this transduction. So we say the sensory receptor transduces the stimulus into an electrical potential. So a definition to know, Transduction is the conversion of a stimulus. So this could be a photon of light, it could be a sound wave, it could be uh, one of the tasty molecules in the piece of chocolate you're eating. It has to take the stimulus and it has to convert it into electrical signal for your brain to understand it. And so we're talking about graded potentials and then eventually action potentials. Also, uh, last semester we talked a lot about graded potentials and action potentials. I wanna point out that when we look at sensory systems, we usually talk about graded potentials as receptor potentials because they're happening in sensory receptors. So if you see graded potential, receptor potential, or even graded receptor potential, they all mean the same thing. And as a quick review from last semester, a graded potential is a change in resting membrane potential that can either be in the positive direction, which is a depolarization, or in the negative direction, which is a hyperpolarization.
All right, so back to our steps. So our sensory receptor is transducing the stimulus into something electrical that our brain can understand. If that graded receptor potential is strong enough, so if it meets threshold, we get an action potential that is generated in the sensory neurons, and that action potential is gonna transmit or be propagated through the sensory pathways, where it's going to make it to the central nervous system where it is going to be integrated and processed. So those are the four steps of sensory information processing. And now we're going to look at details. In this section, we're going to cover the general principles of sensory receptors. We're going to talk about graded receptor potentials, tonic versus phasic receptors, and then the principle of adaptation. So receptors are very specific for the type of stimulus that they respond to, and we call this receptor specificity. So each receptor has a characteristic sensitivity to a certain type of stimulus. And this specificity results from the structure of the receptor. So the more complex the structure, the more specific that receptor is for a specific type of stimulus. So for example, in chapter 17, we're gonna talk about the eye and the photoreceptors in your eye, and they are specifically adapted to only respond to photons of light, to light. They won't respond to any other type of stimulus. Now, the simplest type of receptor is what we call a free nerve ending, and this is just basically the dendrites of a sensory neuron. This would be your least specialized type of receptor. So the more simple the structure, the less specialized they are gonna be for a specific type of stimulus. We also need to talk about receptive fields. These are the areas that are monitored by a single sensory receptor. So if we look at this picture down here that's showing us some skin, and we're seeing, again, this is an example of one of the simplest types of receptors. These are just free nerve endings or dendrites of sensory neurons that are embedded into the epidermis of the skin. And so this neuron on the left here is monitoring the area that is shown in this lilac covered uh, colored circle, and that would be the receptive field of this neuron. And then the neuron on the right has its own receptive field. So the receptive field, again, is the area that is monitored by that single receptor. And in general, keep in mind that the larger a receptive field is, the, poor, the poorer your ability will be to localize a stimulus. So for example, if you have a stimulus anywhere in this blue circle down here, this neuron will be able to send a signal to the uh, brain to say this is where you were touched. But if you had two separate touches within this blue circle, you've only got one neuron there, and that one neuron can only send one signal, so your brain would not be able to tell that it was two separate touches because it's only gonna be one signal for anything that touches in this blue area. And we can demonstrate this by a test called the two-point discrimination test. You can do this at home. You can grab a paper clip and unfold it and then bend it over so that you have two prongs. And if each prong, when you touch it to your skin, if each prong falls into a separate receptive field, that'll be two different neurons that'll send the information to your brain. And your brain will say, I feel two different points touching the skin. But if both of these points happen inside the same receptor field, your brain is only going to get one signal and it's only going to feel like one point touched your skin. So this is a way to tell uh, the size of the receptor fields on different areas of the body. And if you do this test, you'll see that your receptive fields on like your fingers are very, very small. That means your fingers can very easily uh, discriminate between very fine points. But if you were to do this on like your forearm or your upper arm or your shoulder, your brain is not gonna be able to distinguish between those two points. Uh, other areas that are not as sensitive are your back, your belly, your thigh, your calf. Um, areas of your face and your hands are gonna be the most sensitive. They have the smallest receptive fields. All right, and let's review a little bit about graded potentials. The details for these were covered in chapter 12, but I'm just gonna do a quick review here uh, to refresh your memory. 
So remember that neurons have a resting membrane potential of around minus 70 millivolts. And when we talk about a graded potential, we're talking about a change in that resting potential. So if a change makes the resting potential more negative, we call that a hyperpolarizing graded potential. And the size of the graded potential will determine the size of the change. So a small stimulus will give you a small change, medium stimulus will give you a medium change, and a large stimulus will give you a large change. And remember, to get more negative, we are opening things like ligand-gated or mechanically-gated potassium channels, which is causing potassium to rush out of the cell, leaving the inside of the cell more negative. Then on the other side, we have depolarizing graded potentials, which are changes in the more positive direction. And these result from opening ligand-gated or mechanically-gated sodium channels, which causes sodium to come into the cell, which causes the membrane potential to become more positive. And again, the degree of change depends on the size of the stimulus. So a small stimulus would give you a small change, and a large stimulus would give you a large change. And just one more uh, reminder, we have this value shown by the dotted line, which is our threshold value. This is the value necessary to open voltage-gated sodium channels and get an action potential. And so a depolarizing potential has to reach threshold, has to reach this dotted line before we would get an action potential. So now we're going to focus on these graded receptor potentials. Remember that these sensory receptors are transducing or changing the stimuli into graded receptor potentials. So the response of a sensory receptor is going to depend on the strength of the stimulus. Again, this is where the term graded comes into play. So just like we saw in the previous slide, we have our resting membrane potential at negative 70 millivolts. In this case, we're looking at just depolarizing graded potentials. A small stimulus would give us a small positive change. A medium stimulus would give us a medium positive change. And a large stimulus would give us a large positive change. So the graded receptor potential, which again depends on the strength of the stimulus, is going to determine if and how many action potentials will fire. So it has to reach threshold to get an action potential, and then depending on how far above threshold it goes is going to affect the frequency of action potentials. So if we look at this image over here, we have a sensory neuron. So up here at our dendrites, this is where our sensory receptors are. So if we have a very small stimulus, we get a small graded receptor potential. In this case, our receptor potential was not enough to reach threshold, so there was no action potential generated. So the sensory neuron, the axon, is not going to send a signal to the brain, and so you're not even going to be aware of that stimulus. All right, so if no action potential is generated, the brain is never going to be aware. If we have a medium stimulus, we're going to get a medium receptor potential. If we hit threshold, now we're going to get some action potentials. In this case, we got four action potentials. Those action potentials are going to travel down the axon. Remember, all or nothing. Once you get them, you get them. And so the brain is going to get these four action potentials. And then on the right, if we have a large stimulus, we're going to get a large receptor potential. If we go higher above threshold, we're going to get more frequent action potentials. In this case, we got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven action potentials in the same amount of time. Those are going to get transmitted along the axon to the brain. So that is how the principle of graded receptor potentials work. And we'll talk uh, more in a little bit about how your brain is going to interpret these signals. I also want to introduce you to the two major classes of receptors. There are tonic receptors and phasic receptors. So tonic receptors are always active, meaning they are always generating action potentials. So these little lines on this graph, each of these represents an action potential. So with these receptors, what happens when you have a stimulus, which is shown by this increased line right here where it's yellow, 
is that the stimulus changes the frequency of action potentials. So you always have action potentials, but when the frequency changes, the brain knows something is happening. So keep in mind, tonic receptors are always active, and the stimulus is going to cause a change in the frequency of action potentials. We also have what are called phasic receptors. Phasic receptors are normally inactive, so they normally do not fire action potentials. And then when you have a stimulus, the stimulus will cause a change in that they will actually fire action potentials, but they usually only do so when there's a change. So when the stimulus starts, they'll burst some action potentials, and then when the stimulus ends, they'll burst some more action potentials. So these are normally inactive, and the stimulus causes burst of action potentials when conditions change. So like when the stimulus arrives and when the stimulus goes away. We also are going to talk about receptor adaptation. So when we talk about adaptation, we're talking about a reduction in the sensitivity to a particular stimulus. So when we look at receptor adaptation, the level of this is taking place at the receptor itself. So the receptor itself is having reduced sensitivity if there is a constant stimulus present. And this is a type of what we call peripheral adaptation. So there are two broad classes of receptor adaptation types. The first one is called a slowly adapting receptor. So the perp, uh, pink line shows our stimulus being on and our stimulus going off. The green line shows our receptor potential. So with the slowly adapting receptors, we get a response as soon as the stimulus arrives, but the receptor is going to still have a response during the entire time that the stimulus is present. It may have a reduced response as the stimulus goes on and on and on, but it's still a response. And so that is what we call a slowly adapting receptor. These are typically your tonic receptors, which are the ones that are always uh, firing at action potentials, but the frequency changes during the stimulus. Then we have fast adapting receptors or rapidly adapting receptors. Again, if you notice while the stimulus is on, we get one quick response of our receptor and then our receptor goes back to normal. And then when the stimulus turns off, we get another very quick response of our receptor, and then the receptor goes back to normal. So these are called rapidly act adapting receptors, and these are typically your phasic receptors, which are only firing action potentials when things change. So as we just mentioned, peripheral adaptation is when you have changes in the level of the receptor activity to reduce sensitivity to a constant stimulus. And as we also just mentioned, you have both slow adapting and fast adapting receptors. And with peripheral adaptation, the receptor itself is adapting to the stimulus, and so the information is no longer being sent to the central nervous system. But you also have another level of adaptation called central adaptation, where you actually are going to inhibit nuclei along a sensory pathway within the brain or spinal cord. So the receptors are still active and they're still sending action potentials to the central nervous system, but the central nervous system is no longer paying attention to those signals. So if you remember from chapter 16, um, chapter 14, uh, the reticular activating system in the brainstem and the thalamus and the cortex both can filter out uh, what sensory information we pay attention to. And so the fact that if you still receive sensory information but your brain is not paying attention to it, that is what we call central adaptation. So why is adaptation important? Well, if you stop and think about how much sensory information you're getting right at this moment, you've got the feel of your clothes on your body, the temperature of the room, any noises going on in the room, uh, you've got video information coming from this video as well as uh, whatever else is in your room. Um, if you're in your room with other people, they could be talking. Basically, we're bombarded with sensory information from all different directions all day long, and we would not be able to focus our attention if we couldn't filter out some of that sensory information. So when you're focused on a task, like listening to this lecture, you are actually filtering out and not paying attention to quite a lot of sensory information.
So the ability to adapt to sensory information allows us to focus our attention. So as a quick summary of the receptor categorization, we've got tonic receptors, which are always active, always firing action potentials, phasic receptors, which at rest are inactive, no action potentials. With the tonic receptors, once we get a stimulus, that causes a change in the firing pattern, so we may have a change in the frequency of action potentials. Whereas with phasic receptors, you actually get action potentials when you have a stimulus. You may get them when the stimulus starts and when the stimulus ends, um, but you don't have action potentials unless you have a stimulus. Tonic receptors are typically slow adapting receptors and phasic receptors are typically fast adapting receptors. A good example of a tonic receptor is a nociceptor, which is a receptor for pain signals. This is why, because they're slow adapting, this is why you typically feel aches and pains even when you're trying not to pay attention to them, they're still getting through. Whereas thermoreceptors are an example of phasic receptors, your temperature receptors, right after you touch something that's hot or cold, within a few minutes you're no longer consciously aware of the temperature difference. So this section is probably one of my favorite ones, and this is how sensory information is coded, which is what we call sensory coding. So it's all action potentials going to your brain from these receptors. So if it's just an action potential, how does the brain know what type of stimulus it was? Where in the body did it happen? How strong was the stimulus? How long did it last? And was it constant or variable? So we're going to talk about this section, how your brain can determine these things. So let's start with the modality. So how does your brain know what type of stimulus? So it's just an action potential. We learned the action potentials are all or nothing. So how does the brain know the difference between an action potential for sight versus an action potential for touch? So first, a definition. Sensory modality is what we uh, refer to when we're talking about a specific type of stimulus. So touch would be a modality, light would be a modality, sound would be a modality, etc. And your brain knows the modality or type of stimulus based on a concept called labeled lines. So this idea is that our peripheral receptors are linked to specific cortical areas in our brain responsible for processing the sensory information. And so the brain knows the type of stimulus solely because of the area of the brain that the signal is traveling to. So for example, right, you have a photoreceptor in your eye and that photoreceptor, the information is going to travel along a sensory neuron and it's eventually going to go to your visual cortex. And so anything that travels that pathway from a photoreceptor to a visual cortex, the brain is going to interpret that as vision. It doesn't matter if it's actually vision or not, that the brain is going to interpret it because it came along that pathway. So the CNS interprets the modality of a stimulus entirely based on the labeled line. So as I said, the photoreceptor is linked to the visual cortex. So anything that will stimulate a photoreceptor and cause action potentials along that pathway is going to be interpreted by the brain as vision. So for example, if you rub on your eyes, sometimes you can see like flashes of light and that's because when you rub your eyes you might actually activate some of those photoreceptors action potentials are getting transmitted to your visual cortex and your brain is interpreting that or the perception of vision which is why you quote see the flashes of light although they're not really there so again a labeled line is a connection between a specific type of receptor it's the pathway that carries that information to the central nervous system. So anything that comes along that pathway is determined by the brain to be that type of modality. So the brain determines the modality or the type of stimulus entirely based on the pathway the information is traveling. So if it comes along a pathway that goes from your gustatory, your taste buds, to the brain, the CNS is going to interpret that as taste. If it goes from your photoreceptors to the brain, the CNS will interpret that as light. 
from your ear to your brain, the CNS will interpret as sound, etc. So it's the pathway. So think of these like little highways. So this would be like anything that comes in on I-20 is going to be determined to be vision. Anything that comes in on I-285 is going to determine to be sound. Right, so the pathway by which the information travels, they're all cars, they're all action potentials, but the brain is going to determine what type they are based on the pathway. All right, the next type of coding is the location. So where was the stimulus? Were we touched on our toe or were we touched on our arm? And so the location of the arriving stimulus in the cortex is going to determine the location of the stimulus on the body. So you actually have maps in your brain. And so, for example, the primary sensory cortex, which, as I mentioned earlier, is located on the postcentral gyrus of the parietal lobe, it has maps along it for different areas of the body. And we actually call this the sensory homunculus. Homunculus means little man in Latin. And so we have this little man here who basically he's got the different areas of your body is mapped out on the cortex. So you have a specific area for your trunk, a specific area for your neck, your head, your shoulder, your arm, your elbow, your forearm, etc. And the reason this little man uh, is so out of proportion is because we have larger areas of our cortex that are uh, dedicated to things like touch receptors on our lips and tongue, touch receptors on our fingers and hands, and we don't have as many of these uh, touch receptors on other areas of the body, which is why the little guy looks uh, so out of proportion. Uh, the size of his different body parts represents the amount of cortex in our somatosensory cortex that is dedicated to information coming from those areas of the body. So this is how your textbook shows it. Your textbook cuts up the little man and stretches him out over the cortex. So again, this is the primary uh, cortex in the parietal lobe, the primary sensory cortex. So if information comes along a pathway and it goes to this area, your brain knows that it was on the hand. So there's actually two types of pathways. If it comes along a pain pathway, your brain will sense it as pain. And then if it comes along a pain pathway to the hand region, your brain will sense it as um, it'll be pain on the hand. So you can think of these different colored regions over here on the left are the different types of uh, general sensor, sensory information. So one of these colors might be pain, one of these colors might be temperature, another color might be vibration, another color might be pressure. So depending on which color the neuron is going to will tell your brain what the type of the stimulus is, that's the labeled line. And then depending on which part it goes to will tell the brain what part of the body was actually stimulated. You also have cortical maps in your other primary sensory cortex uh, areas. So for example, your visual cortex, which is located in the occipital lobe. Up here is a representation of your retina in the back of your eye. So different areas of the retina go to different areas of the visual cortex. So again, this is how your brain is going to tell whether something you see is in your upper right corner or lower left corner, if it's in the middle of your vision or if it's in your periphery, it's because even your retina is mapped out to different areas of the primary visual cortex. You also have this in the primary auditory cortex. We're going to talk about the cochlea in more detail in chapter 17, but you've got different areas of the cochlea that respond to different frequencies of sound waves. And those different frequencies of sound waves, again, are mapped to the primary auditory cortex so that stuff coming into specific areas your brain can interpret as specific sounds. You even have this with your gustatory cortex, which is your sense of taste, different taste bud receptors on your tongue for the different types of taste actually go to specific mapped out areas within the gustatory cortex. So this is how your brain knows which area uh, something is stimulated. It's because of these maps within the uh, uh, sensory cortices in the brain. And then our last question, how does the brain know how strong a stimulus is, how long it lasts, and is, if it has any variation? These characteristics are carried by the frequency and the pattern of the action potentials in either one or multiple neurons.
So we already saw this with the graded potentials. So we saw how a strong stimulus will cause a higher frequency of action potentials than a smaller stimulus. So down here in pink, we have the size of the stimulus. The middle is the size of our receptor potentials or graded potentials. And the top shows our frequency of action potentials. So a, the brain can know that one stimulus is stronger than another based on an increased frequency. It can know when a stimulus starts and stops. Uh, that's the duration by the pattern. So when the action potentials start firing, this high frequency and then when they end so this would be the start this would be the end so that's how it can tell the duration and then also variation so if a stimulus starts off soft and then increases then you'll start out with a smaller number of action potentials that will then increase in frequency we can also take a look at this picture to sort of drive the point home on the left side here we're looking at a, at a single sensory neuron so you can see how a weak stimulus may only stimulate some of the dendrites. So you're going to get uh, far fewer action potentials than with a strong stimulus that is activating multiple dendrites. You can also have this information coded when you've got more than one uh, sensory neuron in an area. So a weak stimulus is only going to cause one sensory neuron to send signals to the brain whereas a stronger stimulus will cause multiple sensory neurons to send signals to the brain. Um, so again, there's multiple ways between the frequency and the pattern of action potentials and one or multiple neurons that can tell the brain the strength, the duration, and the variation. Okay, in this section we're going to look at the different types of receptors that we have with our general senses. So there are four broad classifications of receptors, and then we're going to talk about each one individually. But there are nociceptors, thermoreceptors, chemoreceptors, and mechanoreceptors. And each of these classes has its own distinct structural and functional characteristics that we're going to uh, walk through one by one. So we're going to start with nociceptors. These are receptors that are stimulated by pain. They can be found in your skin, in your joints, in the periosteum covering your bones, and in the walls of blood vessels. And in fact, last semester I mentioned migraine headaches and how they were related with the trigeminal nerve. And in fact, migraine headaches involve nociceptors that are in the free nerve endings around your meningeal blood vessels, so the blood vessels in your meninges. So this is an example of having nociceptors in your blood vessels that give you the sensation of pain. In this case, it's a headache. So nociceptors are usually free nerve endings, and they usually have large receptive fields. So their signals can be experienced over a um, relatively large body area, and it can be hard to actually truly localize a specific point that was injured that would cause um, that particular sensation of pain. There are multiple subtypes of nociceptors. We're not going to go into the specific subtypes, but some subtypes uh, are sensitive to temperature extremes, like extremely hot or extremely cold. Some are sensitive to mechanical damage, so if the skin, for example, actually tears open. And others are um, sensitive to dissolved chemicals, like histamines and other chemicals released by mast cells in your connective tissue. Nociceptors are tonic receptors, so that means that they are always firing, and when they have a stimulus, they will change the frequency of their action potentials. And so they are also slowly adapting receptors. This is why pain uh, seems to last for a long time. And there are two broad classifications of axons that carry pain information to the central nervous system. There are the type A fibers, and you learned about the different fiber types back in chapter 12. Type A fibers have a large axon, and they're covered with myelin. And these carry what we call fast pain. And these can provide a more localized uh, sensation. And in this picture over here, the A fibers are the, these two on the left that have the little myelin sheaths. And so this is your type of like sharp prickling pain that you feel at the onset of a new injury. Other pain messages are carried by type C fibers, which are small axons that are unmyelinated, shown here on the right side, 
we call the, these our slow pain signals, and this would be more like the burning and the aching type pains that you feel and which can last long after an injury is over. So in grad school, when I was learning about injury, pain, and inflammation, uh, one of my instructors said, always just remember, shit happens. So if you remember uh, the letters, S-H-I-T, H-A-P-P-E-N-E-N-S, it encompasses a lot of what happens when you have an injury and inflammation, which results in pain. So believe it or not, serotonin, that neurotransmitter that actually enhances our moods, actually can also act as a pro-inflammatory molecule and can make us more sensitive to pain. Histamine uh, is that chemical released by mast cells and basophils when you have tissue injury. You also get activation of the immune response. You get tissue damage, as I mentioned earlier, which is going to activate those mast cells and basophils to release the histamine. You have what's called hyperalgesia, which is an increased sensitivity to pain. So think about this. This is a good example. If you've ever like burnt your hand on the stove or a hot surface, that area is more sensitive to future pain. So like if you were to lightly pinch that area, it would hurt a lot more than pinching an area that was not damaged. There's also something called an axon reflex. I'm not going to go into detail, but basically this is the way these neurons can work that actually allow the inflammatory response to spread to nearby tissues. Uh, the whole sensation of pain involves neuropeptides like substance P. Substance P is actually a neurotransmitter involved in pain pathways. And then we also have endorphins and enkephalins, which are part of our natural um, pain relieving molecules that we produce. You also have prostaglandins, which are huge inflammatory mediators, and they cause vasodilation of your blood vessels. This causes blood to move into an area that's been injured, which causes it to turn red and get hot and swell up. And did you know that when you take a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug, commonly called an NSAID, like aspirin or ibuprofen or Aleve, these drugs actually inhibit the enzymes that make prostaglandins, and that's how they work. You also can get swelling due to the movement of fluid into interstitial tissues, and this is called edema. Nitric oxide is another compound that's involved. Um, it, it is also a very potent vasodilator. And then you can also get activation of the sympathetic division of the autonomic nervous system, which is your fight or flight system. So you don't need to know this level of detail. I just wanted to give you an overview. We're going to talk a little bit more about inflammation and the response to an injury later this semester when we get to the immune chapter. I just wanted you to see um, kind of like all the behind the scenes things that are going on when you actually have uh, a painful stimulus. So the second type of receptor is called a thermoreceptor. These are stimulated by temperature stimuli. These are just free nerve endings, just like the pain receptors. And they can be found in the dermis of the skin, in your skeletal muscles, your liver, and your hypothalamus, which if you remember from chapter one, is the control center for your uh, body temperature regulation. So whether you get too hot or too cold, um, the hypothalamus is the control center, so you, it has to be able to sense temperature as well. You actually have three to four times as many cold receptors in your body as you do warm receptors. But there are multiple types of each type of receptor. So there are three different types of cold receptors, four different types of heat receptors. And uh, you can see from this little chart here the different temperatures that will activate these different receptors. The ones that say noxious, so noxious cold and noxious heat down here at the bottom, the noxious part means that these are combination temperature and pain receptors. So that's when, the, when a uh, cold temperature is so cold, it actually causes pain. Same thing with the heat. When it's so hot, it actually causes pain to touch. And then you've got just your normal temperature receptors, which are the non-noxious versions. So some of these are combo pain and temperature receptors. Those are going to be the ones on the extreme ends. These are phasic receptors, which means they only fire action potentials when conditions change, and they are fast-adapting receptors. 
and another did you know capsaicin which is the um, compound in chili peppers that gives it its kick actually calls TRPV1 channels to open so capsaicin when you eat spicy food you're actually activating one of your combination heat pain receptors um, some people like the sensation and so they eat a lot of spicy food other people do not like it and so they don't eat spicy food The third class of um, receptor is the chemoreceptor. These are stimulated by carbon dioxide, oxygen, and pH. They can detect very small changes in the concentrations of these specific chemicals and compounds that are dissolved in the body's fluids. And they are located in the brain and some of the major blood vessels. So you have some that are in or near the respiratory centers of the medulla oblongata, you have some that are in the carotid arteries, which are the arteries taking blood to the brain. And you have some which are in the aorta, which is the major artery that leaves the heart, which we'll cover later this semester. So all of these uh, chemoreceptors are sensing pH, oxygen, and carbon dioxide. And so this is going to allow you to change your respiratory and cardiovascular activity accordingly. You are not consciously aware of these receptors, so the chemoreceptors do not take the information up to the primary sensory cortex. Instead, the information is routed only to the brain stem. So your sense of how much oxygen, pH, and carbon dioxide you have in your blood is not something you'll ever be conscious of, but it is unconsciously causing your body to change, um, you know, for example, your breathing rate to compensate. Also, did you know that the gustation, which is taste, and olfaction, which is smell, both also use chemoreceptors, but their chemoreceptors are more specialized than these in the general senses, and we're going to talk more about them in Chapter 17. The last class of receptor is the mechanoreceptor. These are mechanically gated ion channels, so they're stimulated when the plasma membrane is distorted, as shown here at the top of the image. So if the plasma membrane uh, moves or gets pulled apart, that's going to cause the channels to open and ions can move through. You can also have scenarios where the channel is attached to cytoskeleton inside the cell and extracellular matrix fibers outside of the cell. And so any movement of these uh, fibers will cause the channel to open. And here is just another example showing um, how the channel can be opened by um, movement of fibers in and around the cell. So there are actually three subtypes of mechanoreceptors. There are tactile receptors, which allow us to sense touch, pressure, and vibration. There are baroreceptors, which, which allow us to sense pressure in um, the sense of like an organ that is expanding or distending. And then there are proprioceptors, which allow us to sense the position of our joints and our skeletal muscles. So we're going to look at these three a little more closely. So let's take a look at tactile receptors. These are located mainly in the skin and other external structures. They are stimulated by touch, pressure, and vibration. There are six subtypes, which range from simple to complex, and we'll look at those on the next slide. But you can divide these receptors into two broad classes. There are fine touch and pressure receptors, which are extremely sensitive and have a very narrow receptive field. Remember, the smaller the receptive field, the more detail you can sense. So these provide detailed information about location, shape, size, texture, and movement. So think about, for example, the tips of your fingers and how you can determine even you know, the smallest variation in the texture with the tips of your fingers. Then you also have crude touch and pressure receptors. These provide poor localization because they have larger receptive fields, so you don't get as much detail. So here is the image from your textbook with the six different types of tactile receptors. I'm not going to go into the level of detail that the textbook goes into. I just want to point out that you have crude touch receptors, which are free nerve endings, and also you have what's called a root hair plexus, which is a nerve that wraps around the base of your hairs.
You have fine touch sensations, which are provided by your Meisner's corpuscles, which the textbook calls tactile corpuscles. And you also have these called down here at the bottom left called tactile discs, and they previously were called Merkel's discs. Both of these provide your fine touch sensations. Your deep pressure sensations uh, come from the Piscinian corpuscles, also called lamellar corpuscles, show down here in the bottom right, and Ruffini corpuscles, also called bulbous corpuscles, down here in the middle. And then vibration is sensed by the Piscinian corpuscles and the Meisner corpuscles. So notice that the two um, of receptors that have the most complex structure actually allow you to sense multiple sensations. Meisner allows you to sense fine touch and vibration, and Piscinian allows you to sense pressure and vibration. That's the, uh, as much detail as I'm going into with the tactile receptors. But I also want to mention tickle and itch because tickle and itch are also both related to touch and pain. The receptors are free nerve endings and the information is carried along those type C fibers like the slow pain signals. Tickle sensations are usually considered to be pleasurable but not always and the responses can vary widely from one individual to another. But itch sensations are considered to be highly unpleasant. In fact, they can be more unpleasant than pain because some people will continue to scratch an itch beyond the sensation of pain and breaking tissue just to try to get rid of the itch. And itch receptors, there's still a lot of research going on uh, with these and a lot we don't know. But we do know, for example, that they can be stimulated by the release of histamine. Um, and so this is part of like um, an allergy response, for example. So if you have an allergy, that can lead to itching. And did you know that itching has its own term? It's called proreception, not to be confused with proprioception. The second type of mechanoreceptor is a baroreceptor. These are stimulated by changes in pressure. And this is not pressure like touch pressure. This is pressure like an organ that is expanding. So think of like a balloon. This would be like the pressure you have in the walls of the balloon. So it's going to measure distension or expansion. So these are free nerve endings that you would find within elastic tissues that are in the walls of distensible organs. So for example, in your stomach. So when your stomach is empty and it's as small as it's going to be, all of the channels would be closed. But then if you have a full stomach, then the, the stomach itself um, is enlarged because it's full of food and that's going to cause the plasma membranes to stretch, open these channels and give you a sensation of a full stomach. So you can find baroreceptors in your digestive, reproductive, urinary and respiratory systems and in major blood vessels. So you've got baroreceptors in your carotid and your aorta. You've got them in your lungs. You've got them all along your digestive tract, so in your stomach and intestines. You've got them in your colon. This is actually how you get the uh, trigger that you feel like you need to defecate is because of these baroreceptors. The same thing in your bladder. So baroreceptors in your bladder signal you to know that it's time that you need to uh, urinate. And the last type of mechanoreceptor is a proprioceptor. Proprioceptors monitor the position of joints, the tension and ligaments in joints, and the state of muscular contraction. Sometimes we call this our body sense or our sense of the position of our body in space. Proprioceptors are only found in skeletal muscles and joints, so they're only uh, part of the somatic system. You're never going to have a sense of like where your pancreas is sitting because your visceral organs do not have proprioceptors. Proprioception is mostly processed at the subconscious level, but you can actually consciously be aware of it too. Like if you're just, you know, think where is my hand right now, right? And you're consciously focusing on the position of your hand and the angle that your arm is at, etc. There is no adaptation in these receptors, so they are always on and they are always sending signals because your body, uh, your brain needs to know where your body position is at any given time. There are three different types of proprioceptors.
There are muscle spindles, which monitor the length of muscles, and these can trigger the stretch reflex that we talked about in Chapter 13. There are Golgi tendon organs, which monitor the, tendon, the tension in your tendons. And there are joint capsule receptors, which can detect the movement of the joints in your body. So the easiest way to understand proprioception is to look at what happens when it's not working or look at children because a lot of times children are learning their body sense and when you're first born, you don't have a sense of your body yet. So your hands may flail, your legs may flail. And so to give you an example, quote unquote clumsy children, right? Children who are learning their body awareness or their proprioception, they might grab stuff too hard, like they might break a pencil when they're trying to write with it. Um, they might hug too hard. They might step on your foot and not notice. They might easily sit on the edge of a chair and fall off of it, maybe trip too often, maybe get a little too close. Maybe they actually have to look at their feet when they go up and down the stairs or else they'll, they'll trip and fall move either too fast or too slow, resulting in a loss of balance or just bumping into people and objects. So these are all uh, symptoms of having reduced proprioception. Your doctor can give you a test called the Romberg test to measure your proprioception. You take off your footwear and you stand uh, barefoot or sock footed. You close your eyes and your ability to stay upright and maintain your balance has a lot to do with your proprioception. It also has to do with the, the vestibular organs in your inner ear, which we'll talk about in chapter 17, um, but it also has a lot to do with proprioception. If you don't have your proprioception, you will probably fall over in this scenario. So, a summary of the receptors for the general senses. We have nociceptors, which um, respond to pain signals. These are typically free nerve endings. There are separate fibers for carrying fast pain versus slow pain, and these receptors are slow adapting. There are thermoreceptors, which uh, sense temperature. These are free nerve endings and fast adapting. There are chemoreceptors that sense uh, chemicals like pH, oxygen, and carbon dioxide. These are found in the brain, carotid, and aorta, and you have no conscious awareness of this sense. You have mechanoreceptors, and there are three types of these. There are tactile receptors that respond to touch, pressure, and vibration. There are six subtypes, and they can be divided into fine and crude. You have baroreceptors, which sense pressure and expansion of an organ. You find These are free nerve endings that you find in the walls of distensible organs. And then you have proprioceptors, which give you your sense of body position. There are three types of these, and these never adapt. So that is the general sense receptors. In this section, we're going to talk about sensory pathways, the general pathway, and then somatic versus visceral pathways. So the general sensory pathway is applicable to most of your senses and it includes a three neuron pathway. What we call the first order neuron travels from the periphery to the spinal cord and that is shown by the blue neuron in this image at the bottom. These are unipolar neurons with the cell bodies in the dorsal root ganglion next to the spinal cord, also called the spinal ganglion and then their axons will enter the spinal cord through the dorsal or posterior root. So that is the first order neuron is going from the periphery to the spinal cord. The second order neuron is shown in green here and this one is traveling from the spinal cord up to the thalamus. And we use a term called decussation to describe when a neuron crosses from one side to the other so a lot of your uh, sensory neurons will cross from the left to the right and also from the right to the left. This is why most of the sensory input from the right side of your body will end up going to the left side of the sensory cortex and vice versa. And that is because the second order neuron is usually the one that will cross over from one side to the other. So we say that it decussates. And then you have the third order neuron, which is shown in yellow up here. And this one is traveling from the thalamus 
up to the cortex to allow for conscious awareness of that sensory information. And um, for the general senses, this neuron will be going to the primary sensory cortex in the parietal lobe. So if we look at some specific somatic sensory pathways, remember that when you see the term tract, that means a bundle of neurons that has a common origin and a common destination. So there are three major somatic sensory pathways. There is the spinothalamic pathways shown in green in this image showing the uh, tracks in the spinal cord. There is a lateral spinothalamic tract and an anterior spinothalamic tract. Then there are the posterior column pathways, the gracile fasciculus and the cuneate fasciculus. And then there are two spinocerebellar pathways shown in yellow, a posterior and an anterior. So if we look first at the spinothalamic pathways, these are the pathways that are going to carry crude touch, pressure, pain, and temperature sensations. And notice in these images, your first order neurons are shown by the red line. So the first order neuron is the one that is coming in from the periphery to the spinal cord. And you can see the cell body here in the dorsal root ganglion. The white neurons in this image are your second order neurons that are going from the spinal cord up to the thalamus. And the third order neurons are going from the thalamus to the primary somatosensory cortex. Decussation of the spinothalamic pathway occurs at the same place in the spinal cord where the signal enters. So if you look down here at the bottom on both sides, you can see the signal comes in and then the white neuron, which is the second order neuron, immediately decussates or crosses sides. So it goes from the left to the right or from the right to the left. Then the thalamus is going to filter the input before it passes it on. So as mentioned before, we are not always aware of every single sensory input that comes into um, our body. So we do have it filtered for us so that we're able to focus and pay attention to stuff without being aware of every single piece of sensory information. And the final destination is the primary somatosensory cortex, which is on the postcentral gyrus of the parietal lobe. And as mentioned before, you've got different areas of the cortex that are dedicated to specific areas of the body. And we call that a little sensory homunculus or a little man. If we take a look at the posterior column pathways, these carry fine touch, vibration, pressure, and proprioception. And again, we have the three different types of neurons. The first order neuron is shown in red. And notice that in this case, the first order neuron comes into the spinal cord and is actually going to travel quite a way before it synapses onto um, the second order neuron. And so decussation in this case doesn't occur until it gets up to the brainstem area, so around the area of the medulla oblongata. And after it crosses, it's going to enter a path called the medial lemniscus. The medial lemniscus is a specific name of a tract of axons within the brainstem itself. And again, the information is going to go up to the thalamus where it's going to be filtered. And then our third order neuron is going to go from the thalamus up to the primary somatosensory cortex, just as we saw with the spinothalamic tract. And finally, we have the spinocerebellar pathways. These carry only proprioception signals. Decussation occurs in some of the second order neurons, but not all. So if you look at the example here, again, the first order neurons are shown in red, and the uh, white neurons are the second order neurons. And you can see the one on the left is crossing sides, but the one on the right does not cross. So um, some of these do cross, some don't. And there is also no third order neuron. So in this case, the second order neuron is going from the spinal cord up to the cerebellum. So it doesn't go to the thalamus. And so uh, there is no conscious awareness of these particular sensations. So all of our conscious awareness of our proprioception comes from the posterior column pathways because the spinocerebellar pathways never make it up to the cortex for us to have conscious awareness.
So the final destination for these neurons is the Purkinje cells of the cerebellum. And this is part of how the cerebellum maintains your balance and your equilibrium, is it gets feedback from the position of your muscles and joints through this proprioceptive uh, information, and then it knows, um, you know, what position the body is in. It can make the corrections necessary for you to maintain your balance and posture. There are also some visceral sensory pathways that carry uh, sensory information from your visceral organs. So we call these enteroceptors because they are receptors located on the inside of the body and they monitor the visceral organs of the thoracic cavity and the abdominopelvic cavity. These include a variety of nociceptors, thermoceptors, uh, tactile receptors, baroreceptors, and chemoreceptors. The first order neurons can often travel with autonomic motor fibers, and in this particular example, um, we are showing a first order neuron in pink. And so on the left side, it's actually traveling along with motor fibers of the vagus nerve that are part of the autonomic system. And you can also have uh, the autonomic uh, motor fibers go into the spinal cord as well with the first order neurons. And the second order neurons in these cases go from the spinal cord up to the solitary nucleus in the medulla oblongata, also called the nucleus of the solitary tract. And that is shown by the little um, blue arrow over here on the right side. And these particular neurons, the second order neurons, can actually travel with the spinothalamic pathway. So they join up with the somatic pathway, and that becomes important in a few minutes when we talk about what causes referred pain. There are no third order neurons in the visceral sensory pathways, so you have no conscious awareness of the information coming from the enteroceptors from your visceral organs. In this section, we'll see how characteristics of sensory pathways can result in things like phantom limb pain and referred pain. So a phantom limb is the feeling that you still have a particular limb that has been amputated. And most frequently, pain in the missing limb is what uh, typically will drive amputees a bit crazy and they have to seek medical help for this condition. And phantom limb pain is actually caused by stimulation of the missing limb areas of the sensory homunculus and the primary sensory cortex. So remember we have these maps in our brain, so different parts of the body are mapped out on the primary sensory cortex. And this map uh, stays in place even after you've had uh, an amputation of a limb. And actually you're born with this map in place. So even if you're born without an arm or a leg, you still have the areas in the primary sensory cortex that are mapped for arms and legs. So what actually happens is after an amputation, in this particular example, we're looking at the amputation of like an arm. And so you have this area of your primary somatosensory cortex that normally gets sensory information from your arm. And so after the amputation, now that arm is missing and it's no longer sending sensory information, but you still have this area mapped in your brain. Furthermore, uh, because you're not getting so many signals to this area, uh, neurons that go to neighboring areas can actually start spreading out and going into this missing area, but the map is still there. So a signal that arrives in this area will still be interpreted. Remember, a, your perception is the interpretation of a um, sensation. So an action potential that arrives to this area is still going to be interpreted or perceived by your brain as taking place in your hand, even though you may no longer have your hand. So this is uh, why we have phantom limb sensations, and this has to do with the mapping of the sensory areas within our brain. Referred pain comes about because if you remember, I mentioned earlier that visceral sensory neurons, so sensory neurons carrying information from the viscera in your abdominal, pelvic, and thoracic cavities, travel alongside somatic sensory neurons in the spinothalamic tract. So what happens is if you have a really strong visceral pain, 
that can activate the neighboring somatic sensory neurons. It's almost like the, the electrical charge can bleed over and cause activation of those neurons. So for example, if you have a very strong sensory signal from the heart, that is going to travel alongside somatic sensory neurons from uh, the regions that cover your spinal segments, T1, T2, T3, and T4. And because those neurons travel together, a very strong activation of the heart sensory neurons can cause you to feel pain in your left chest and down your left arm. Likewise, if your appendix has a very strong pain signal, that's going to travel alongside neurons from the T10 spinal segment, and that's going to cause you to feel uh, somatic pain in this area. So you're not actually technically feeling or consciously aware of the visceral pain. It's just the visceral pain is activating neighboring somatic sensory neurons, which gives you a feeling of pain in those corresponding areas. So here are the common referred pain areas. So if you have problems with your liver and gallbladder, you may feel that in the upper right quadrant or even your right shoulder. The heart uh, can be, uh, referred pain can be felt in the left side of the chest, the left neck, the left shoulder, and down the left arm. Your ureters, which are uh, the tubes that travel from your kidneys to your bladder, can be felt in this area shown in yellow. And then you've got areas over here shown for your stomach, your small intestines, your appendix, and your colon. So again, you're not technically actually consciously feeling pain from those visceral organs. You're feeling nearby somatic sensory neurons being activated. In this section, we're going to look at the somatic motor pathways. So now we're talking about commands going from the brain down to the skeletal muscles. So remember from chapter 14 that the primary sensory cortex, also called the primary somatosensory cortex, is located in the postcentral gyrus of the parietal lobe. And also remember that the primary motor cortex is located in the precentral gyrus of the frontal lobe. So we've already introduced you to the idea of the sensory homunculus and how the primary sensory cortex in the parietal lobe has this map of the body so that sensory information from different parts of the body come into a designated area within the sensory cortex. Well, you also have a motor homunculus on your primary motor cortex. So in this little brain drawing in the middle, the motor cortex is shown in red and the sensory cortex is shown in blue and you have a homunculus on both sides, one for each side of the body, one for the left side, one for the right side. And so just like with the sensory homunculus, sensory information comes in to these specific areas. With the motor cortex and the motor homunculus, this is where commands going to skeletal muscles start. So for example, if you're going to move your thumb, the motor neuron that controls the skeletal muscles in your thumb will start here in this area of the motor cortex. And so if we compare these two maps to each other, they are a little bit different. So remember that the sensory homunculus, the reason that some of the little guy's uh, body parts are exaggerated is because these are areas of the sensory cortex that have a greater number of neurons coming into the sensory cortex. Well, with the motor homunculus, if we draw this little guy out, he represents the various parts of the body that have motor neurons. So you can see that, for example, your hands, your lips, your tongue have the most number of motor neurons, and that gives us the uh, finest level of control. So we have very fine motor control over our hands, not so much over our legs. And so um, they're similar, but they're not exactly the same. So a basic somatic motor pathway only has two neurons. So it has an upper motor neuron shown in this image in red. The upper motor neuron, the cell body, is going to start in this primary motor cortex in the frontal lobe. 
and then it's going to descend down into the brain stem and the spinal cord and the upper motor neuron is the one that will usually cross sides so it decussates or goes from one side to the other sometimes it will cross up in the area of the brain stem sometimes it won't cross until it gets to the uh, actual region of the spinal cord where it exits but it does usually undergo decussation so again the left primary motor cortex is going to control the right side of the body and vice versa. Then the lower motor neuron, which is shown in white, the cell body is going to be in the brain stem or in the spinal cord, and the axon is going to go out through the ventral root to a skeletal muscle. So note that only the axon of the lower motor neurons is going to extend outside of the brain and spinal cord. Also keep in mind, and we covered this uh, back in chapter 10, one motor neuron will innervate a single motor unit in a skeletal muscle. And so a motor unit is all of the individual muscle fibers that are innervated by that single motor neuron. So if you need to review, that was in chapter 10. So you have three major somatic motor pathways, and they are shown in this uh, cross section of the spinal cord. There are uh, a couple, actually three corticospinal pathways, although only uh, two of them actually descend all the way into the spinal cord. There is a lateral pathway, and then there are three medial pathways. So let's look at the corticospinal pathway. This is the one where it's, all of these are going to start in the primary motor cortex. And these pathways provide your conscious control of skeletal muscles. So like when you decide to raise your arm or lift your leg or bend over, right? All of those commands are going to travel along corticospinal pathways. There are three main tracks. There are corticobulbar tracts, which go from the primary motor cortex and end in the brain stem. They actually become part of the cranial nerves. They become uh, the motor commands that go out to skeletal muscles controlled by cranial nerves. And bulbar is a Latin term for brain stem. So it tells you that this tract goes from the cortex to the brain stem, and that's where it ends. And then farther down into the spinal cord, you have a lateral and an anterior corticospinal tract. These tracts are very large and they actually have the shape of a pyramid within the spinal cord. So these are sometimes also called the pyramidal system or pyramidal tracts. So you may see that in other textbooks. There is one major lateral pathway and it is going to be responsible for your subconscious control of your upper limb muscle tone and movement. So subconscious because it is not starting in the primary motor cortex, so you don't have conscious control over it. This is the rubrospinal tract, and the name tells you that it starts in the red nucleus of the midbrain. Rubro is Latin for red. So the upper motor neuron is going to go from the red nucleus to the spinal cord, and then the lower motor neuron will still go from the spinal cord out to a skeletal muscle. There are three medial pathways, and these are also subconscious control, and they're subconscious control of your skeletal muscles and your reflexes, um, like your auditory and visual reflexes that we briefly introduced you to in chapter 14. There is a vestibulospinal tract, and this one is going to start in the vestibular nuclei of the uh, medulla oblongata, and then they're going to go down to the spinal cord, and the second neuron will go from the spinal cord out to a skeletal muscle. There is the tectospinal tracts. These are going to start in the superior and inferior colliculus, and remember that collectively these colliculi are called the tectum, so that's where the name tectospinal tract comes from. It runs from the tectum to the spine. And these are the ones that are going to control your auditory reflexes and your visual reflexes. So like when you whip your head around to a loud sound or when you, uh, you know, suddenly dodge something being thrown at you, right? So these are those reflexes uh, that we talked about when we introduced you to the tectum last semester. And then there are also reticulospinal tracts, which start in the reticular formation of the brain stem and again travel down to the spinal cord.
These tracks are sometimes called extra pyramidal tracks because they are outside of those large uh, pyramid shaped tracks that make up the corticospinal pathways. So to summarize all of the somatic spinal pathways, we talked about the major somatic sensory tracks. We had a lateral and an anterior spinal thalamic uh, pathway. We had two posterior column pathways, the gracile fasciculus and the cuneate fasciculus, and we had a posterior and anterior spinocerebellar pathway. And then we had major somatic motor tracts. We had uh, a lateral and an anterior corticospinal pathway and a corticobulbar pathway that ends in the brainstem. There was the rubrospinal tract that was part of the lateral pathway, and then the three medial pathways, the vestibulospinal tract, tectospinal tract, and reticulospinal tract. So when you're trying to learn these different tracts, note that the names can tell you a lot. So for example, spinothalamic tract is telling you that it's going from the spine to the thalamus. Well, that means that this information must be moving in an upward direction. Therefore, it must be sensory because sensory goes from the body up to the brain. Conversely, corticospinal tract tells you it's going from the cortex to the spine. So cortex is up, spine is down. So this tract is going in a downward direction. Therefore, it must be a motor tract that is sending commands from the brain to the spinal cord. So let the names help you when you're trying to learn these tracks, um, rather than trying to treat them all as individual pieces of information. And in this last section, we're going to look at the cerebellum and the basal nuclei and see how they monitor and modulate motor commands. And we introduced you to both of these structures in chapter 14, so you may want to refer back if you don't remember their location or major functions. So this picture is actually from chapter 14, and it shows the basal nuclei that are embedded deep within the cerebrum. Remember, they're made up of multiple regions, uh, including the caudate nucleus, the putamen, and the globus pallidus. And the basal nuclei work together to adjust the activities of upper motor neurons in both the corticospinal tracts and the reticulospinal tracts. And we mentioned this in chapter 14, but the basal nuclei also relies on dopamine neurons that come from the substantia nigra within the brainstem. And if you lose those dopaminergic neurons, either due to a genetic mutation or exposure to pesticides or other causes, it can actually result in a condition called Parkinson's disease in which you have problems with your motor movements. The cerebellum also controls and modulates motor movements. So as a movement is underway, the cerebellum is actually going to take proprioceptive sensations from your muscles and joints. It's also going to take visual information from your eyes and vestibular sensations from your inner ear. And it's going to compare all of those to the movement that you're supposed to be doing to make sure that the movement is fluid and smooth. And so basically it is comparing the arriving sensory information to the motor command and making adjustments. So in this little example here, right? So we have our primary motor cortex and it's going to send an initial motor signal out to the body. The cerebellum is going to get a copy of that signal and then the cerebellum is going to say, did my arm end up where it was supposed to be? And that is proprioceptive information. My eyes will say, is the arm where it's supposed to be? And then of course, if I'm doing something with my legs, I'm also going to have to make sure that I'm balanced. And it's going to compare all of that sensory information to the motor command and it's going to make corrections to that motor signal as necessary. And so patterns are learned by trial and error over many, many repetitions. And we can see this in animals learning to walk. So if we see just a quick little clip here of a baby learning to walk, you can actually see that the cerebellum hasn't yet learned these movements. So the brain is saying, I want to walk, I want to stand on my legs, I want to move my legs. But in, initially, there's all kinds of errors. And the cerebellum is getting information from uh, the vestibular system, the proprioceptive system, and the visual system to correct those errors. And it can take a lot of trial and error in order 
uh, to finally learn how to do those movements smoothly. And it's not just humans. You can see this in animals that are learning to walk as well. Uh, you can actually see their uh, cerebellum that is in training as they are trying to uh, correct their motor commands to do what they actually intended to do, which is to walk smoothly. So to summarize, uh, the cerebellum and the basal nuclei, they both have these loops where they get copies of the motor commands that are coming out of the primary motor cortex, and they are adjusting those motor commands so that our final movements are smooth. And there are slightly, um, there are some differences between the two systems in terms of what type of motor commands they actually modulate. And the cerebellum is getting a lot of sensory information like proprioception and visual and balance information, which the basal ganglia uh, doesn't deal with. And the basal ganglia has those dopaminergic neurons that are affected by Parkinson's. But the final take home message is that both of these systems are using feedback and these uh, feedback loops to ensure that you have smooth coordinated muscle movements and damage to either one of these systems can result in uncoordinated uh, muscle movements and lack of muscle control with the symptoms being slightly different and that's going into too much depth for this course um, but there the symptoms of like Parkinson's and ataxia caused by cerebellum do have their differences and then I like this picture as well because it shows um, again, you've got commands from the motor cortex that are going down through those corticospinal tracts out to the spinal cord, but then you're also sending copies of that signal to the basal ganglia and to the cerebellum, and you can see here how the substantia nigra, this is where those dopamine neurons are, are talking to the basal ganglia. You can also see how the red nucleus and the rubrospinal tract get involved and how the vestibular nuclei and the vestibulospinal tract get involved. And it's all one big giant coordinated mess, so to speak, that results in you having smooth coordinated muscle movements that you usually just take for granted. Also, we talk a lot about the thalamus in terms of how it relays sensory information. We don't talk as much about the fact that it also relays motor commands uh, throughout these loops. Um, so the thalamus does play that role as well as the role it plays with sensory information. And that is the end of chapter 15. So make sure you get started with the studying. So start the semester off on the right foot and make sure that you can finish strong.